All right, and next thing I'm going to do is um, turn it over to our wonderful speaker today, Alyssa Ford Morell, and have her give herself her introduction. Thanks, Leslie. Um, I'm really happy to be here and make this presentation. Uh, I really enjoy this presentation a lot. I've made it several times before, but I've frankly redone it almost completely for this uh, presentation. So there's a lot of new pictures, even if you've seen this before. Um, so as Leslie said, I am uh, not only a master gardener and a master naturalist, but I co-coordinate with my friend Alda Krinsman, the Audubon at Home program for Arlington and Alexandria. We'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment, but um, I want to start the presentation with a little bit about Master Gardeners, since I am presenting this for the Master Gardeners of Northern Virginia. Um, in a quick nutshell, the Master Gardeners are a wonderful organization of volunteers. The entire mission of the Master Gardeners, uh, whether it's here in Arlington and Alexandria or anywhere in the country, is to provide good science-based education about agriculture and horticulture and all sorts of planty sort of things to the general public working through the Cooperative Extension. If you're not familiar with what the Cooperative Extension is, the cooperative part of it is that it is uh, a joint effort of federal, state, and local uh, governments to provide good information to people who need it, uh, good information about growing plants. Uh, many years ago, back in the 1940s, it was figured out that, oh my goodness, there are way more questions about this topic than the poor cooperative extension agents were able to answer as single people doing their job. And so they started the program of Master Gardening to recruit volunteers and educate them in a way to provide these kinds of, of answers. Um, here locally, the Master Gardeners of Northern Virginia, which is the Arlington Alexandria uh, arm of, of that, uh, has been promoting public education uh, through several means. One is our help desk, which is uh, in non-COVID times open from 9 to 12 on weekdays. Now it is operating virtually. We also, again, during non-COVID times, have plant clinics at libraries and farmers markets and often pop up in, in various places. Um, we offer all sorts of classes which have gone online and, and here we are doing a class. Um, and we have a bunch of demonstration gardens throughout Arlington and Alexandria where you can go and see how things are growing locally. If you don't know a plant, we may have it in a demo demonstration garden so you can see it. We demonstrate techniques, we demonstrate varieties of plants, all sorts of things. Um, one of the things that I do as a master gardener is that I co-coordinate uh, one of the demonstration gardens, the one at the Glen Carlin Library Garden. And um, absolutely love that. I invite anyone who um, is interested to stop by, take a look. I'm particularly proud of all our great signage that uh, really explains what the plants are. So even if the master gardeners aren't there, you can learn a lot by visiting a demonstration garden. Our website is very easy to remember. It's mgnv for Master Gardeners of Northern Virginia .org. Um, And again, our whole point is to provide non biased research based information, but you can get that great kind of information. Also, we love to share the tip of how to do your own research which is that when you are researching a question, if you end what your search term is with the phrase, cite 
colon dot edu or site colon dot gov, you will limit the results to educational or governmental sites which are offering research-based information instead of just, you know, hey, my great aunt Tilly used to do whatever to get rid of slugs. Instead, you'll, you'll find the really good information that says, here's what actually works. Um, if you need to get some help IDing a plant, an insect, a disease on a plant, uh, anything like that, please do feel free to access the help desk. It is quite marvelous, manned by some of our absolutely finest master gardeners who are so knowledgeable and really have learned by having to answer questions um, so much about what is locally an issue. Um, the phone number um, is unfortunately not being answered right now because uh, of COVID, but we're doing everything through email. And the email address is mg for Master Gardener, ARL for Arlington, ALEX for Alexandria, at gmail.com. So M-G-A-R-L-A-L-E-X at gmail.com. You can send your questions, and if it's for an ID, please send as many photos as you can. Get in close to what you're asking about, uh, stand back, you know, turn things over, get a lot of angles. That really helps us be able to do the ID. Um, and we will get back to you. If the help desk people themselves don't know the answer, they'll research it. If they don't know, it goes to the extension agent who knows a great deal. If she doesn't have the answer, she'll research it. If she can't find the answer by research, it will go to Virginia Tech and the uh, department, the, the people there who work in the uh, botany and horticulture uh, offices there will get the answer and you will hear back. I, this is one of the things that I just think is one of the greatest secrets that you will get a good answer back if you ask the question. Uh, and again, just to, to remind you that not only is this class being done today, but we have been throughout the year being uh, presenting the virtual classroom classes every Friday at 10 o'clock and occasionally some other ones too. So please keep checking the mgmv.org website to keep on top of those. And before I go forward, I just want to take another second since I'm also a master gardener to explain and contrast what's similar and different about being a master gardener as versus a master naturalist. Um, master gardeners go through a 70 hour class uh, training that uh, helps them learn all about the kinds of things they're going to need to know about. And then on a continuing basis, we have to do a certain amount of volunteer work every year and a certain amount of continuing education. And of course, our mission, as I said, is to provide education. Master naturalists, are similar, a parallel organization that does run through the Cooperative Extension, um, but their mission is a little broader. And so while Master Naturalists go through uh, 70 hours of training, um, only part of that is on plants. Part of it, uh, you know, there were classes on reptiles, on insects, on geology, on water, the entire natural world. And master naturalists also are, part of their mission, are able to give uh, not only the education, but they're able to do citizen science. So they may be involved in documenting what insects are in a certain area, or doing Christmas bird counts, um, all sorts of citizen science things. And they can also do actual hands-on 
service in the natural arena. So I have personally participated in a number of invasive pulls and um, planting native plants to replace invasives and help at uh, nature centers, that sort of thing. So that's what being a master naturalist is, is versus a master gardener. They are both wonderful programs. If it is at all of interest to you, I certainly encourage you to take a look at um, what it might take for you to become one of those great volunteers and join in doing this work. Okay, onward to our presentation. Moving on to our main presentation. Uh, and I am here to talk about um, creating habitat and how we can be involved with our natural world and all within the context of the program that I am so thrilled about, Audubon at Home. But everything we're going to talk about is applicable whether you participate in Audubon at Home or not. So this is not to say you can only pay attention to these things if you're going to um, follow the Audubon at Home program. So here's the deal. I truly believe that as humans, we have a fundamental responsibility to care for our environment responsibly. I was raised in a very religious setting and the Genesis story um, really sank into me and I took that whole creation um, where they said that God gave humans dominion over the earth to mean that we have responsibility to take care of the earth. And I know that so many different religious traditions support that and um, even people who are not religious, you know, see the, the vital importance of how we as humans are impacting our environment and we have responsibility to pay attention to that. Um, in order to be responsible, we must understand the interconnectedness of all living things and to support the ecological relationships. I just started this little video of a carpenter bee on a passion flower that I filmed um, earlier this year in my own front yard. And I think it's a really wonderful illustration of the relationship between the plant and the animal. Carpenter Bee is working so hard. His, actually, I think it's a her. Um, her livelihood is dependent on her gathering that nectar. You can see she's going after the nectaries right now, sipping. And as she does so, that flower has been built almost like a car wash to rub her back with pollen. And you can see she's covered with the little golden grains of pollen that when she flies to the next flower, that pollen is what is going to fertilize the next flower. So talk about interconnectedness. And we see this over and over again as we look at nature. And we've got to support those ecological relationships. The choices of what we do, even in our own space that we are in charge of, have a profound effect on the diversity of life, um, obviously within our own yards, but also our community and the greater planet. And so I see this as a wonderful opportunity. Uh, so here's the question, what is a healthy yard? And in many ways, I have to say, a yard is, you know, not a yard at all. When it's a healthy space, it does so much more than what we might think of being encapsulated by the word yard. Instead, it's a habitat. There are all sorts of creatures that will be born and live their entire life and die within the space of ground that you may claim to own or to occupy or to rent. Um, there's all sorts of insects that will never go more than a few feet from where they're born. So to them, your yard is a universe. They're, this is all they're really going to know. Uh, so we have the choice whether we want 
our space to be a sanctuary for that wildlife um, or not. And of course, it's also a great place, hopefully, for you and your family to enjoy. Um, a healthy habitat provides that natural haven that supports all sorts of creatures, the insects, the reptiles, the birds, and the people. Um, and it really connects and extends your home to the larger space around you. Uh, Audubon at Home certification as a certified wildlife sanctuary uh, helps you learn how to be a responsible steward of your piece of earth uh, by taking to heart and acting on the principles in the Healthy Yard Pledge, which is really the basis of this presentation. We're going to go through that pledge and explain how it works. So here's the items that are within the Audubon at Home Healthy Yard Pledge. And they include eliminating or at least reducing the use of pesticides, conserving water, protecting water quality, removing invasive exotic plants, planting native species and supporting birds and all other kinds of wildlife on your property. Um, because as, as it says here, because every property counts. Uh, they all add up to a greater whole. So let's start with that first one, eliminating or reducing pesticide use. Uh, it's really important to really consider the food web. And here's a very simple illustration of a food web. You can see that at the bottom, it starts off with plants. And we know this, that we, we were taught way back in elementary science that the, the beginning of the food chain starts with the plants, um, which is very, very true. They get eaten by all sorts of other creatures, um, and which then get eaten by other creatures, and it keeps going and going. And of course, we humans are in this food web too. But I want you to notice that some of these relationships go back and forth, and certainly they all go back and forth because when any of these creatures die, they then break down and their energy and nutrients is eaten by the other creatures in that food web. Now, um, some of the things that I want to point out here are um, some of the specific creatures. Uh, when I'm doing this presentation with a live audience, I love to ask people if they know what this picture is here of this green creature here. I'll give you a hint on a tomato plant. And most people within any group that I've presented to, somebody uh, who's grown tomatoes will say, oh, that's a, a tomato hornworm or a tobacco hornworm. Uh, and that is absolutely what it is. It's one of these creatures that if you are trying to grow your tomatoes, you're often quite dismayed to see this big creature that seems to have huge jaws and be just eating through your plant in a big hurry. But this particular creature also has something else on it that is not quite as usually seen, and that is these interesting white shapes that look as if there's kernels of rice attached to it. And those are actually the cocoons of a tiny little parasitic wasp. The parasitic wasp has laid her uh, eggs and, and they've made these cocoons on this tobacco hornworm. And I like to call this worm a dead worm crawling because as those baby wasps hatch out, and this is really kind of disturbing, they are going to eat that worm from the inside. It is going to be their first meal. And by doing this, the parasitic wasp keeps the tobacco horn, horn worm population in control. If we had gotten to that tobacco horn worm first and smashed it up, um, then that little tiny parasitic wasp would have had no place to lay 
her babies. And in fact, the control of the hornworm would not have been available. The fact of the matter is that Mother Nature tends to know best. She is able to create a balance. And so um, even though we think this is a bad worm um, for our tomato plant's health, the fact of the matter is that it has a very important place in nature. Uh, for those of you who do grow tomatoes, I'm not telling you you have to live, leave every one of these alive, but um, one of the suggestions given to me years ago by a fellow master gardener was what I want to pass along to you. Uh, anybody who grows tomatoes usually finds that in year two or three, they start getting a few odd volunteer tomatoes that come up in a strange spot. And often they don't even taste as good. Their skin is often very tough. Go ahead and leave that little plant, let it grow. And that becomes your sacrificial tomato plant. So that if you find a tobacco hornworm trying to eat your uh, tomatoes that you're trying to grow, just move it over to the sacrificial plant and let it go ahead and live its life or become a meal for the parasitic wasps. If it makes it through to adulthood, it is quite a stunning um, moth all of, in and of itself. Um, this picture over here is actually one that I'd like to point out. Um, a lot of people know that ladybugs are really wonderful at eating aphids. But what they don't know is that this is a baby ladybug. They're called ladybug lions, and this is a larva of a ladybug. And if ladybugs like to eat uh, aphids, ladybug lions like to eat way more aphids. They are champion aphid consumers. A lot of people find this to be kind of a scary looking thing and they think it's bad. In fact, you need to learn, oh no, if you get one of these guys, they're going to be champion um, eaters. The pattern on the back, the coloration will be different. I, I'm actually afraid that this may be one of our non-native Asian ladybug lions, but in any case, they're this little critter that looks almost like, I always think it looks like a alligator. Um, and if you see one of those, count yourself lucky. I've included this great picture of a bluebird with a worm in its mouth because I want to remind everyone that while a lot of people say, oh yes, I want birds in my yards, the fact of the matter is that about 95% of our birds, even the ones who will eat seeds as adults, must feed their babies uh, protein when they are first hatched until they fledge. And so the best protein for a bird um, to give to its baby, the, the most protein rich and easy to digest protein is a caterpillar. And so caterpillars of all sorts and kinds are really essential for bird survival. In fact, there was an amazing study that happened just a few years ago locally in the DC region um, done by Dr. Desiree Naranga as she was doing her PhD in entomology where she studied baby uh, nests of baby chickadees and actually staked out chickadee nests and counted how many caterpillars were fed to these baby chickadees from the time that they hatched until a few weeks later when they left the nest. And the number is so astonishing. I, I try to include it in every talk I give. Um, they have to consume between 4,000 and 9,000 caterpillars in order to make it to the stage where they can leave the nest. So the number of caterpillars in your yard is going to be really critical to the birds and how well they are able to do. Uh, before I leave this slide, any questions on pesticide use? Um, no, we don't have any on pesticide use. I, we did get a question about, um, do you know if there's a good website, this is an interesting question, that has pictures of beneficial insects? 
because I know a lot of us, when we see insects, we tend to be like, they're all bad. And so it would be great to, to know what the good ones look like. Sure. And unfortunately, I don't know that off the top of my head, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time trying to figure it out. What we can do is certainly to try to research that out and um, make a note of that so that when this is posted, we'll try to include something about that. I will say that we really should stop thinking so much about what's bad and what's good. Um, believe me, to a ladybug, an aphid is a really good thing. Um, obviously, I don't want a ton of aphids on my plants, but that if we eliminated the aphids, we'd have no ladybugs. And those relationships are true throughout nature. Um, we do not want to kill the insects that are the basis for the rest of life. Um, and so often we might not like it, um, but we just need to think a little bit differently. Um, for instance, we need to realize that when our plants show that an insect has been eating it, that that means that an insect got a good meal and that insect might in turn become a good meal. If nothing's eating your plants, they're not part of the ecosystem. Uh, and if we're killing the insects by using a pesticide, um, we are really doing damage. I, and I'm sorry, I need to say one more thing about pesticides, and that is don't be fooled into thinking that there's some kind of pesticide that because it's organic or made out of some plant, um, that it's not going to be a problem, that somehow that pesticide knows which insects you want killed and which ones you don't want killed. Um, if it's an effective pesticide, it will kill all insects. It will kill big ones, it will kill small ones, it will kill the life in the soil that is so essential to growing things. So um, when you say no to pesticides, you should say no to all pesticides, whether they're organic or not. So Alyssa, you touched on, the, this is right on point with a, a follow-up question, is BT harmful to good insects? Absolutely. Absolutely, you can, you can absolutely damage all sorts of good insects. The thing to strive for is for a good balance. You want to have so many great living creatures that they create a balance in your yard. Okay, and one follow up, um, what about neem oil? Neem oil is a good control for specific kinds of, of things. Uh, when you're putting it on a limited place, it's smothering, um, it's not doing, it's not being sprayed into the whole big atmosphere. Again, if you can do without, you should try to control lower down on the lower toxicity rung. You try to, um, hand remove things and only start looking at what is more toxic and only do that according to label directions and under very strictly controlled, very careful circumstances. Do not go first to something that is going to wipe things out. Okay, and we're good to move on. Okay. The next principle is to conserve and protect water. And um, one of the big problems that we are seeing climate changes is both too much water and sometimes too little water. Uh, last year here in the DC area, we had too little water. We had a flash drought. And if you weren't providing some supplemental water for your yard, you probably lost some plants. Uh, on the other hand, earlier in the year, we had a phenomenal uh, rain deluge on, I believe it was July 8 of uh, 2019, that absolutely, I believe it made uh, Four Mile Run Creek rise by 11 feet. And that's what this picture is of um, 
a few hours after that deluge, I walked down to Four Mile Run, and here's the remains of the bridge that used to go across there. I believe Arlington County lost six different bridges, which have not all been replaced. This is unfortunately a part of what is going on with our climate. One of the things that we can do to help is to try to design our yards in a way that the water will go down, that if it hits our land, it will not run off. Uh, unfortunately, 42% uh, of Arlington County, I don't know what the percentage is for Alexandria, 42% of Arlington County is in impermeable um, landscape. In other words, uh, parking lots, uh, roads, buildings, where the rain cannot get through that. It has to run off to someplace else. And so our yards are a very important uh, way of allowing the water to, instead of running off into the storm system, and here in Arlington, if it gets into the storm system, it's probably going to get into Four Mile Run, and then it will go into the Potomac, and then out into the Chesapeake Bay. And it will carry with it two things. Uh, it will carry the two most frequent polluters of water. One is it will carry all the excess fertility that we overput on our land, and that's actually another uh, point here that I'll get to in a moment. But it will also, because it puts too much pressure on our streams and waterways, it will dig into the ground, dig out some of that earth, and carry it away with it. So the two big things that actually cause pollution is either uh, excess fertility or actual earth that has eroded. And here you can see a picture um, here at the mouth of the um, Chesapeake on the James River of algal bloom. Um, and this is what happens when there's too much um, fertility out there. We have been working for years and years to improve the health of the Chesapeake Bay, and it has improved because we've been working so hard, but uh, it's only gotten up to a grade of the last I heard was a C minus, which frankly isn't that good. My parents would not have accepted that easily from me when I was in school, and I don't accept that easily of the Chesapeake Bay today. We need to do better, and that starts with us, everybody upstream. The Chesapeake Bay is amazingly the second largest estuary system in the world. We are second only to the Amazon River Basin, um, which means that we're a huge catchment area where the, the rain that comes down for a very large percentage of the eastern seaboard ends up funneling into the Chesapeake Bay. And we can make a difference as to what actually makes it out there or whether it goes through our own land and goes down and recharges the groundwater. Uh, continuing on about water, there are a lot of things that we are able to do uh, to help conserve water. And they're often beautiful things, creative things, some that are really easy and some that are a lot more complex. Um, on the really easy side, we have rain barrels, which are a pretty basic way without a lot of expense or effort to capture some of our own rain and make it available to us to use in our yards. These are my own rain barrels here. Over at the Glen Carlin Library Garden, we have what is essentially um, uh, two much larger rain barrels called cisterns, and we use them all the time to water the plants. And um, once they're set up, they're, they don't take a heck of a lot of effort to get going. Things, uh, another simple thing is that if you live on a hill, which I do, so I really appreciate how challenging this can be, um, you want to find ways to keep the water from running off too very much. And one of the great ways to do that is to create terraces. And you can see 
that terraces can be created in a number of ways. You can actually do formally built terraces with hardscape. You can do it with much less formal um, systems of using branches, using core logs, which are apparently a wonderful way to get that, um, change that slope into a series of terraces, each of which can hold the water and let it go down. Uh, more complicated systems over here, this is again uh, the WNOD Trail, and there where the WNOD Trail meets Columbia Pike, they've recently, the uh, County of Arlington has put in a really great rain garden. Uh, and people don't really realize that it's serving a great big function. Instead, they think, oh, there's a bunch of native plants. But a rain garden is a fairly sophisticated thing that um, you do, and you have to put some effort into it and look at the percolation and how well it's going to work and perhaps amend the, the soil underneath with something that will improve the percolation of water into the ground. But um, by creating a catchment area and planting plants that can either be very thirsty and drink a lot of water in a quick time, or be okay being dry for a while, um, you can gather a lot of water and let it sink down into the ground. Uh, it's important that it not be something that um, takes too long to sink down. You don't want to create mosquito habitat. So anytime you gather water, you need to make sure that it's going to drain within two days or use something so that you are not becoming a mosquito home. Um, there are products called mosquito dunks, which are not broad scale pesticides. Instead, it's a very specific larvicide that stays in the water and does not allow the larva to develop to adults, um, which is what I use in my rain barrels. And then the last picture over here, this is my own front yard, which we redid this last February. And um, we really struggled about how to handle the water because we wanted it to go down and not run off. And we ended up putting in a dry well, which this is the picture of the dry well, which is about to be dropped into this very deep hole, as you can see. And basically, we ended up funneling the water from um, half of our roof, the half that doesn't have the rain barrels, um, into the dry well where it sinks down and discharges, um, goes through the soil and recharges the groundwater. Um, we were very worried because we failed our first perk test. You have to, if you put in a dry well, be able to have it drain quickly enough uh, that it doesn't just simply fill up and sit there. And because we, like so much of Arlington, have a layer of clay, um, it wasn't draining well. And so we had to dig far enough down to go beneath the clay layer, which was a really interesting process. But I am here to tell you that um, this system is working remarkably well. I'm really thrilled with it. And I think we've got one more uh, piece here about water is, and that is to say that the animals on your property do need water. This is a big thing that we can do to support animals on our own property. And again, it can be from something more sophisticated uh, to something more simple. Over here, we've got this beautiful, beautiful uh, fountain that is just a little trickle. And this is in the home of one of my fellow master gardeners. And I have seen so many birds come in there and just take those wonderful baths and drink from there. Uh, but on a much more simple level, um, this is my backyard, and I've got a bird bath back there that is not a very fancy bird bath. Um, it is one, though, that for one thing, it tips up so that every couple days I'm able to dump it out really easily and refill it to get fresh water that won't have any mosquito larva in it. It also, in the winter, has a plug, and I can plug it in, 
it does not make the water warm, but it makes it so that it won't freeze. And you can see on this snowy day that we've gotten a beautiful flicker here that's come in for a drink and a mockingbird is lined up behind him waiting for his turn to, to get the drink. This heated bird bath is extremely popular on days when the snow is covering the ground and ice is uh, potentially making it much harder for, for birds to drink. But depending on what kind of water you add to your yard, you can get all sorts of creatures that you support. Insects, uh, frogs here, um, all sorts of birds. Do keep in mind that either the water needs to move, which will keep mosquitoes away, or you want to use something, um, either dump it frequently enough so that the mosquitoes don't uh, hatch, or use um, a dunk that'll keep them from going on. The next principle is to remove non-native invasive plants. And this is a topic that I absolutely um, take any opportunity to talk about. The more I learn about invasive plants, the more dismayed I am at what has happened to our wild spaces. But a lot of people don't really understand this. And so one of my big things that I try to let a lot of people know is what is really an invasive plant? What do we mean when we say an invasive? A lot of people think that it means that it's a plant that behaves aggressively in your yard. I've heard so many people say, oh, don't plant that. It's an invasive. Well, here's the deal. Invasiveness is a very specific term that, in fact, has almost nothing to do with what it does in your yard. Um, the definition of invasive is first that a plant must be non-native to the area in which it is occurring. So you may have a plant that is not behaving in the way that you like in your yard, but if it's a native, it's not an invasive. It's simply an aggressive native plant. In order to be invasive, it has to be non-native and it has to be capable of escaping cultivation, getting into the wild, and outcompeting the native plants to cause harm in one of three ways. And the three ways are first, to human health. You may have heard a couple years ago there was a local problem where some places were finding some hogweed, which if you got hogweed on you is apparently way worse than poison ivy and if it gets in your eyes, can blind you. That's an example of causing harm, human, harm to human health. Uh, secondly, uh, needs to be able to cause harm to the human eco uh, economy, which might sound a little bit odd, but if you think about animals, the razor clams that are in the Great Lakes area are causing real problem to shipping, and that's that's a, a problem to um, our our money systems. <laughs> uh, and the third thing, the one that we usually mean when we talk about invasiveness, is that it needs to be able to cause outcompete native plants and cause harm to our environment. And that's what most of the invasives are that we're worried about here. Um, here in Arlington, we've got a whole lot of invasive plants. Um, over here, this is an invasive pole that I was working on. Uh, in the corner of my own neighborhood, these are a couple of my neighbors who are helping remove bamboo, a non-native that got out of cultivation and it spreads and it is so difficult to get rid of. Here's another invasive pole I was working on and um, this gentleman took this twist, you can see this giant twist of Asian wisteria off the tree behind him. I don't know if you can see the scars left on this tree. And in fact, this tree did not make it, this tree died. Now, is Asian wisteria beautiful? Absolutely, it's stunning. But it's a killer when it gets out of cultivation. Um, here's English ivy. This is a really interesting picture because it's one that we don't usually see ivy uh, 
sorting the berries. This is what it looks like when it gets, when it reaches maturity and is able to set berries. Usually that's way up in the top of trees and that's why we don't see the berries on ivy very much. But when we let ivy grow up our trees and it starts fruiting, birds will eat these berries, they will fly away, they will poop it out into our wild spaces and it will proliferate. And ivy, English ivy, unfortunately, supports only two kinds of animals, from what I've heard, and they are rats and mosquitoes. Uh, and it can absolutely, over time, help to bring trees down. Uh, here is a part of the Four Mile Run Trail that is absolutely covered primarily here with porcelain berry. And then this video that I um, of a beautiful, beautiful flower, um, the sweet autumn clematis. And I'm just showing a little example of how you can tell the difference from our native clematis that looks so similar, but the leaves on the sweet autumn are actually smooth, uh, as opposed to our native ones have uh, jagged edges. Um, and so this is another point about invasives. Nobody ever said that invasives don't have good points. They are often very pretty, they're very hardy. They came here from somewhere else and left their natural predators behind. So they're able to do great with nothing eating them. And most of the invasives in our Northern Virginia area also aren't even eaten by the deer, which is part of the reason that our natives have such a hard time and the invasives don't. The, the deer absolutely eat them. So it really is an important thing to get to know the invasives and to remove them. Um, virtually all of the invasive plants have some really great native alternative that you can use instead. Uh, if you haven't heard of golden ragwort, it is my um, favorite replacement for English ivy. It's, uh, it takes sun, it takes shade, it's semi-evergreen, and it spreads aggressively. Now you may want to think about whether you want it, because it is fairly aggressive, it'll cover an area pretty quickly, um, but if you're trying to replace ivy, that's a really great way to go. Uh, Leslie, any questions on invasiveness? Well, one question about the, the vine that was removed off that tree. Somebody asked if they have, they'd have been taught for English ivy that you cut off around the bottom, but you leave the vine on the tree. Is that Absolutely. what you recommend? Okay. That is, yes, if you have ivy growing up your tree, do not try to pull it out of the tree. It has put little air roots into the bark of the tree. And if you try to pull it, out of the canopy, you will no doubt damage the, the top. But what you do is you cut uh, an area a foot or two wide and go all the way around the tree. And that, that sounds simple to say you'll go all around the tree, but I have any number of times come back to trees where I had done that on a tree that had ivy and somehow one little thing of ivy I didn't cut and it's still going up there. Um, so I encourage you to go back and take a look again. The stuff that's up the tree once it's cut off will eventually die and it'll fall out slowly over the years. You can cheer every time it does. And then from, from that point out, if you want to do more ivy removal, you pull it away from the trunk and go from there. Okay, and there was some discussion too about um, mosquitoes and how long it takes to hatch. And the discussion said that as long as you tip the water every three days, that you should be okay. Is that what you? Yeah, mean? It's two to three days. I I like to go with two so that I'm not pushing the limit. Um, but I think three is is truly what it takes um, for them to hatch out, depending on their species and probably also on the weather. Okay, and then we are getting some questions about um, replacements for invasive plants, and I'm gonna load up, um, Elaine Mills is one of our other master gardeners, has done a wonderful um, presentation on that, so I'll refer them to that website too, or to that recording as well. Absolutely, Elaine's presentations are absolutely worth watching. She has also been instrumental in doing a bunch of um, 
sheets, uh, information sheets that are available on the MGMV.org website um, under plants and um, they're problem plants. And they list uh, each, each one talks about a problem plant, why it's a problem, and gives a number of alternatives. And sometimes it's not, you know, a one for one. It depends on what it is about the problem plant that you like and that you'd like to duplicate as to then which is the right replacement for it. Uh, and that is an absolutely fabulous, fabulous resource. So. All right, well, I'll put that one up too. Um, now we have a question. Are there certain grape plants that are invasive? If they, they have a lot of vines that look like grape vines, but they produce berries and not grapes, so. In our area, the porcelain berry vine looks like a grape. And let me just say, in case people think I'm being all superior here about, you know, removing invasives, I have nurtured so many invasives in my day, not knowing what they were, not understanding what invasiveness was. And certainly porcelain berry is one of them. Porcelain berry was brought here by the nursery trade because it is a stunningly beautiful plant. When the berries set, they turn purple and green and aqua, and they're so pretty. And it looks like a little grape plant. When I first had it come up in my yard and I didn't know anything, I thought, oh, maybe this is scuppernog that, you know, I didn't know what it was and I let it grow. Um, we do have a native grape vine and um, it is sometimes hard to tell the difference. The native grape vine has little tendrils that the porcelain berry does not. There is also a difference in the pith. If you cut the um, stem, if it's thick enough, you will see one of them is brown inside and one is white. And I am going to appeal to the people who are listening to chime in to the chat box and say which is which because I always can confuse it. Every time I go out for an invasive pull, I look up which is which. I think that Porcelain berry is white and, and our good grape is brown, but is anybody chiming in yet? No, I don't see that, the answer to that well, one. Somebody's, somebody's going to do that. And <laughs> you, next time we break, tell me. <laughs> okay. okay. All Anything right. Else? Go on. Okay. We're going to keep moving. So. The great thing about removing invasives is that it makes more room for native plants in your yard. And I sometimes say, half jokingly, but really half not jokingly, that my mission in life is to help people fall in love with a native plant because we've got some absolutely amazing native plants. Um, I mean, take a look at this native beauty berry here, which right now, these berries are, are on the plant. They also have very pretty flowers in, in the springtime. Um, well, actually later in the summer. Uh, there is a non-native beauty berry. I happen to think that our native one is even prettier than the non-native one because the berries are bigger and they go all around the stem here. Um, Depending on what you're wanting to accomplish, um, these plants are your workhorses and they are going to do really great things for you. Just in case you want to know what any of them are, over here is the trillium. And this is a little trillium in my yard that I just think every time you're able to see a trillium, it just, I don't know, it feels like a little blessing from nature. Um, here we've got a plant that most people wouldn't love, but I absolutely do love. It's the field thistle, and it is absolutely a butterfly magnet, as you can see. Um, milkweed, this happens to be the common milkweed, uh, Asclepius uh, syriaca, uh, which is, uh, milkweed is the only kind of plant that monarch butterflies can eat when they are caterpillars. So the butterflies lay their eggs on milkweed plants. Here in our um, national capital area, we've got 
I don't know, 10, diff 10 to 12 different kinds that are regionally native. Um, but this common milkweed is, is absolutely one of the best. And I have allowed my yard to get quite filled with it because every time I see a monarch caterpillar, it absolutely throws me to my soul. Um, and the monarchs need our help. They are struggling so badly. Their populations have really been hit. Uh, by habitat loss, both along their migratory routes as well as uh, in their overwintering spots. But we can help them out by planting milkweed. And I always say, if you plant it, they will come. Uh, it may take a year or two once you've uh, started planting your milkweed or any of these other plants that are meant to support specific creatures. Uh, but they will eventually come if you've planted enough of them. Um, we've got the beautiful Liatris flowers. This is such a great plant here, uh, Golden Alexander or Zizia, um, which is another plant which really serves a lot of purposes. It, <coughs> excuse me, it can take sun, it can take shade, it sets these beautiful flowers. And it is our locally native host to black swallowtails. Um, so you could find black swallowtail caterpillars on uh, Zizia. Oops, I went ahead and forwarded that, but I was about to anyway. Um, every plant that you put in has a purpose. They will do things. They will provide shelter for the animals. They will provide food for the animals. And they will provide beauty to our own spaces. Uh, I love to show this little picture here of the mockingbird in the winterberry over at Glen Carlin. Um, every winter, our winterberry sets these stunningly beautiful red berries, which tend to stay on the, the shrub for a very long time. They don't get eaten until the end of the winter. I think that the cold helps make them more palatable to the birds. But this little um, stand of winterberry every year has this pair of mockingbirds that claim it as their territory. And pretty much every time I park there, I see these wonderful mockingbirds. And in the springtime, the male will sit there and give his voice, uh, vocal marking of his territory. That's how they mark their ter ter territory, by going through their whole repertoire of different songs. They always repeat each song uh, three to five times between, before moving on to the next one. It's absolutely wonderful. Okay, and in case anybody else wants to know what these plants are, this is another gay feather. Here is some beautiful goldenrod fireworks uh, with an oak leaf hydrangea, and this is a New England aster. Okay, and then moving on, and I'm just going to show you this little video here on my uh, on my goldenrod. These shrubs, not shrubs, perennials, are covered with pollinators right now. Um, it is absolutely, if you could spend time looking at this, you would find hundreds and hundreds of pollinators that are so happy that I am really close up to these and they pay absolutely no attention to me. They are so concentrated on getting this late season nectar and pollen that is gonna help them make it through the winter. Um, it's, it's really a fun thing. And then of course, there's my Audubon at home sign <laughs> that, I, that I had to end on. But there's so many advantages to native plants. Um, for one thing, they really are beautiful. They're there's just wonderfully fabulous plants. In Virginia, we have a huge variety um, we are at the top of the southern range of plants, at the bottom of the northern range of plants. We get plants that uh, grow in the mountains. We get plants that grow on the coast. So we have a really great variety. We also have more information about what is locally native than most places in America do. 
Uh, if you are not familiar with the Plant Nova Natives website and their publication about um, native plants, you should absolutely familiarize yourself with their work. Um, we know from their effort exactly which plants have actually been historically in our northern Virginia counties. And that's something that's actually quite difficult to find out in other parts of the country. So um, it's a free book if you want to download it off the website. If you find it in a nursery and want to buy it, it's usually about $6. So it's a, a wonderful investment. Um, the natives that grow here are probably going to do really well. They are adapted to this region. This is where they develop. And so as we move into more challenging climates um, where plants are asked to deal with even more hot, more dry, more rain, um, the natives are the ones that are have been adapting to this region. They're going to continue adapting to this region, and they're probably going to do the best. They don't need a lot of watering or fertilization or pesticides once they get established. Um, in fact, um, they, they need very, very little. Some of our native plants actually kind of like low fertility, believe it or not, so they're going to be happy. And um, native plants evolve to support our native insects and butterflies and birds and everything else. And so, um, we can bring plants in from elsewhere, but our local insects might not be able to enjoy them and eat them or digest them. Okay, Leslie, any native plant questions? We did get one question about if you see um, caterpillars for like monarchs and such forth, do you try to protect them or do you just let nature run its course? That's a really good question, one that I have spent a lot of time thinking about and answering for myself. I believe very strongly that what we need to do to help the monarchs and any other caterpillars is provide more habitat. That is what they are lacking. That is what, why they are struggling. Nature says, remember what I said about the uh, little tiny chickadees needing four to 9,000 different caterpillars just to get out of their nest. Uh, nature knew that. This is no surprise to the butterflies. The butterflies, monarch butterflies, lay thousands of eggs and they hatch out. And a big part of the purpose is then to feed and, and be able to feed the birds but still have enough that make it to maturity. If we decide that we are going to harvest all the caterpillars and protect them, um, then we are potentially depriving the birds of their food. Um, and there have been some studies that have shown that when, particularly if you take the caterpillars inside, they are not as good about knowing how to migrate on. Um, so while I appreciate 100% appreciate that we want to protect these guys, the best thing that we really can do is to make sure that they have lots of habitat. And that's really what what Audubon at Home is about. Do you think I've answered that question sufficiently? Yes. Um, okay, and then we did have some questions about the, the native, like what were the plants that you had pictured? Um, so maybe at the end, if we want to go back to that, those particular slides, and if you know the names of them, you can say them for everybody. Um, there's, you, as, as you know, when we talk about natives, people always want to know exactly what they're seeing and, you know, go from there. Absolutely. Um, and I would love to also say, do take advantage of the fact that we've got demonstration gardens because seeing the live plant is even better than seeing a photo of the plant. And um, I think all of our demonstration gardens have a number of natives, except of course the organic vegetable garden, which is demonstrating how to grow vegetables, um, some of which may be native, but not very many. Um, but And then we've 
all of the demonstration gardens have worked very hard on signage. I know that at Glen Carlin, where I work, I feel very proud of our signage, which Elaine Mills, who we've already been giving a lot of credit to today, uh, is really the, the person who has recently uh, been doing that along with Judy Funderburg. Um, and so even if we're not there, you can look at the sign and see what they are. And um, we've got some good natives over there. Okay, and then specifically, we want to put some emphasis on trees. That study that I've already mentioned a couple times about the chickadees and how many um, caterpillars they need, also looked at where the chickadees found the caterpillars. And most of the caterpillars were found on native trees. There is a hierarchy of plants, and there's been a lot of study done, so we actually really know which plants support which insects and how many there are. And the champion uh, supporter of Lepidoptera, meaning moths and butterflies, therefore they make caterpillars as babies, um, is currently the white oak tree. I believe it supports, and I could be off by, by one or two, but I know it's over 500, I want to say 537 different kinds of Lepidoptera are supported by the white oak tree. It used to be the American chestnut tree, which, as some of you know, is essentially almost no more because of essentially an invasive uh, blight that came on Came, came to America from Asia and has made our American chestnuts so that they cannot reach maturity and set new nuts. Our American forests used to be dominated here in the East by the chestnut and were apparently completely different kinds of forests than we see today. With the chestnuts passing, it has been the white oak that became the top tree. Part of that study that looked at where the chickadees found their caterpillars uh, was able to then look at the spaces that actually support the wildlife, support the birds in particular. And they came up with what I find to be such a handy and helpful number, which is that to really be a wildlife supporter, a space needs to have 60 to 70, emphasis on the 70%, native biomass. And if you think about biomass, that means actual stuff that is native, um, you know, you could have one tiny trillium, that's one plant, and a tree is another plant. But when you look at biomass, they do not compare at all. The tree is thousands of times greater in biomass than the trillium. And so if you have a few native trees on your property already, you are in great luck because you are probably much closer to that important goal than people who don't. If you don't have native trees on your property, plant them. Get them going. You know that old proverb that they say the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. The second best time is today. Get your trees planting. You might want to take a little bit of time, learn about which trees are going to uh, speak to your heart. I have a few favorite of my own. I'm very fond of, of sassafras and service berry, but find out what will work in your space and start thinking about how you can incorporate a tree into your space. I know right now, if you are in Arlington and you want to add a red bud to your property, Arlington is currently giving them away. Um, and there's some information, we'll try to add that on about where to go to get a free uh, little tiny red bud start. Um, and red buds are a lovely native tree, but trees do so much. Um, they are really a part, and um, 
this graphic here, I, I know that it's a little bit too small to look at closely, but the fact of the matter is that trees play a huge part in the entire um, water system. And I know after that big flood that we had last year on July 8th, um, one of the things that was being said was that if we want to help prevent those kind of floods, one of the best things that we can do is to plant more trees because they really help mitigate the dangers of floods and reduce the actual runoff. Um, so a tree is a great thing to do. And another thing that I've got to say is that even trees, once they're dead, are of great value. Uh, I understand that there is far more life in a dead tree than in a living tree. So if you can find a way to keep a dead tree on your property, I know that sounds a little weird, but our next slide will show a little bit more about that. Ooh, yes, there we go. Um, here we show, um, this is actually some friends of mine in their yard, and they had two very large trees that over the past few years have died. And they decided in part because they're bird watchers and they are trying to convert their yard to native plants. Um, but they decided that they, while they didn't want the trees to topple over and potentially do great damage, they top these trees rather high up and they have had such a great time watching all the woodpeckers come and get at all those insects because that's what trees do. They become food as the fibers of the tree and the nutrients break down all sorts of insect and fungus and um, all sorts of things use that tree as a larder and and pantry to be their storehouse of food. Um, and so you can do that if you have a snag, that's what we call a dead tree. Look at it as something really valuable. And if you can find a safe way to keep it, that can really do a lot of good. Another thing that you can do is with the dead branches. And most of us who have trees know that periodically through the year, especially after any sort of storm, there will be some branches that fall down. And those branches, if you can find a place that is appropriate on your property, and some properties do not have an appropriate spot, I acknowledge that. But if you have a place that is not going to um, annoy your neighbors or be unsightly, you can create a, a wood pile, a, a stalk of, of branches that you simply, that's what you do with those branches that come down and you build them up. You can see here, this is against a fence and they've put two little supports so that it contains these. But this is gonna become amazing habitat for all sorts of birds that will use these little crevices to hide in, maybe to nest in, depending on what kind of bird they are. Uh, reptiles will, will access the parts down here, spiders. Um, this is going to be a really wonderful biological source uh, if you can provide a wood pile. Uh, another thing that you can do to support birds is to look at your own windows. This is my own front window and you can see I've put some butterfly decals on it. Um, unfortunately, birds do not see glass in the way that we do. And if you've got a big window, you probably know that birds will sometimes fly into it. Uh, the bigger the window, the bigger the problem it is. And so we as humans can do some things to mitigate that. Um, there are a number of ways that you can do that. There are products. These happen to just be some, some butterfly decals that I put on my windows, and while it has not completely el eliminated bird strikes, it has really helped to cut down on it. I'm not getting the same bird strikes that we used to. Um, vertical lines on the windows, either in the form of something that hangs on the window, or potentially some people actually use little um, grease pencils and draw lines on themselves. Um, 
I believe it needs to be between one and two inches wide. It needs to be fairly narrow, but those are the best way to keep birds from uh, running into the windows because they think it's just an extension of the outside. They need something there that's going to tell them, oh, wait a minute, there's something here I need to stop. Um, so that's another way to support and protect birds. Um, if you don't have a big fountain or anything, you can just put a saucer out of water and look at how these birds are just going crazy, taking baths, getting drinks. You know, again, you're going to want to keep them from becoming mosquito sinks, but um, definitely you can do this in easy ways. I also want to challenge you to, if you have a fear of some of these insects, try to get over it. Uh, this is a great big spider that, um, yeah, when I see it now, I'm a little nervous. It, it always gets my attention. But over time, I have come to see the absolute beauty of a creature like this. And um, this is one I was gardening right by the spider and was shocked a carpenter bee ran into its web and I actually saw the spider spinning this around. Unfortunately, I did not have the presence of mind to get my camera out and get a video of it quickly enough to see it making this bundle. But um, this is all a part of the cycle of life. These spiders want nothing to do with you. They want to be left alone. Um, I have started leaving the spiders that make it into the corners of my bathroom up high in place. They're little tiny spiders and they're going to catch the mosquitoes and gnats that I really don't like. And so I feel that they're providing valuable environmental systems uh, services to me and I try to leave them. So um, do think about all the ways that you can support the wildlife and make friends with them and appreciate what they're doing instead of saying, oh, it might get on me, I'm going to be afraid of it. Um, frankly, if they get on you, they probably are not going to do anything to you. Just keep your eyes open. Okay, I'm going to keep going on here to the very last of the uh, Audubon Healthy Yard Pledge points and certainly the most controversial and that is keeping cats indoors. The fact of the matter is that every year in America, according to the American Bird Conservancy, cats kill 2.4 billion, and that is with a B, a billion, 2.4 billion birds every year. Here's a quote from the Smithsonian Project Nest Watch uh, that says, migratory birds have virtually no nesting success in areas where people let their cats out. To the extent that if you have a cat that you let out, I am going to suggest that you do not do things like having bird feeders or bird boxes because cats will stake those out. It drives me crazy when neighborhood cats come to my yard and stake out my, my bird feeders. I do not blame the cats for that. It is totally in their nature. They are natural hunters. People think I must hate cats. Until recently, I had four cats and we lost one of them. And I'm, I'm still very much in, in mourning for Bastet. Um, I love cats, I absolutely adore them. But we're all bird watchers, my cats do so from inside. Now, here's the deal. As I have made Audubon at home visits, I have actually tried to give this information as an outdoor cat has made its way around my ankles and I've reached down and petted it. Um, here's the message I have for people who have cats that go out. I get it. If you have a cat that's used to going out, it is practically cruel to try to keep them in. 
So what I ask people to do is to look at how they can reduce the amount of time that their cat goes out. If they can make sure that their cat is well fed before it gets, goes out and that if and when they get a new cat, they have a very serious talk with their veterinarian about keeping cats indoors as versus letting them outdoors. Because what I have read is that cats that are indoors only have lifespans that are generally about three times as long as outdoor cats. Now, the well-fed tabby that goes out for a short amount of time is going to do far less damage than the colonies of feral cats that absolutely have to, to hunt in order to survive. Surely those are the areas in which uh, the, the worst problem occurs. But in our own neighborhoods, and our own homes, believe me, the cats that go out absolutely do kill. We could actually make a really good argument that cats are an invasive species. These cats, domestic house cats, are not natural to, they, they did not develop here in Northern Virginia, and they do inflict harm on the local species. So um, I would really like our entire country to move towards the idea that a cat is like a dog, that if it goes out, it's on a leash or in some way contained so that it does not go out and hunt things uh, that are wild and needing, needing the ability to survive. Okay, any questions, Leslie, at this point? And there were um, some questions about the, the bird bath and um, putting dunks in a bird bath. That's safe to do, is that correct? It is safe to do, absolutely. Um, I will add a little bit about um, where to buy native plants. And we are fortunate enough here in Northern Virginia to have a few nurseries that are exclusively native plants. That's a fairly rare thing. Um, so they're available at almost any time with great selections. But we also have every year, usually in both spring and fall, of course, not so much this year because of COVID, but um, there are a number of native plant sales where various vendors from the region will travel and set up a booth and have their native plants available. Um, and there's actually at this point, there's probably a couple dozen through the Northern Virginia region each year. Uh, People who become Audubon at Home clients, after we've made a visit with you, we do put you on a mailing list and we assemble a list of all those native plant sales and we send it to you. We are not trying to sell anything, but people find it really helpful to know when those native plants are, sales are. And so that's one way to get that information to come to you is to go through the, native, the Audubon at Home program or to go to the Plant Nova Natives website, as you already said. Okay. Okay. I'm going to move on and wrap this up. This is a really important quote. We can know, and I'm just going to read it. I don't usually like to read stuff here, but um, it's from Doug Tallamy, whose book, Bringing Nature Home, was a landmark book and he's got a new one out called Nature's Best Hope. And if this talk has in any way been of interest to you and you want to learn more, I invite you to look up anything that Doug Tallamy has written or look at any of his talks, which are widely available on YouTube. But here's what he said. We can no longer hope to coexist with other animals if we continue to wage war on their homes and food supplies. As gardeners and stewards of our land, we have never been so empowered to help save biodiversity from extinction, and the need to do so has never been so great. That idea of empowerment is so meaningful to me. I really do feel that there is a great deal that we can do in our own yards. And once we've done it in our yard, we can connect with other people and it becomes a larger and larger area 
which we have made a habitat for the animals that need it. So this is, this is a quote near and dear to my heart. Um, really quickly, I see we're, we're just about out of time. There are a number of advantages to doing this sort of thing. For one thing, you know, when you use less water, you're going to save money. When you get certified, you're demonstrating your personal values. Um, you know, getting certified and making these kind of changes complements other things you may already be doing, like recycling and uh, adding, you know, accessing solar power. Um, garden design tastes, this is a really important one, are really changing. The um, ultra manicured, huge lawn and a few foundation plants aesthetic of the 50s and 60s is really no longer what we think is a beautiful yard. Um, these days, we really understand and appreciate that native plants are a wonderful part of the landscape. Um, by participating in this sort of thing, you become part of a network of people who are dedicated to this, and it's not just individuals, it is schools and churches and so forth. And of course, you have the personal benefit of the increased connection to nature. So if you're interested in the Audubon at Home program, the elements of it include following and adopting the Healthy Yard Pledge, we requesting a visit from an Audubon at Home ambassador who comes to your home at no charge to not only explain the program, but to go through your yard, help you talk about program areas, help you identify what plants you have that you may not know. Uh, then you work to attract and document 10 sanctuary species. Uh, Audubon at Home has identified about 40 different species that need some help. It tends to be heavy on the birds because it's Audubon, but it's not exclusively birds. And we say that once you can show that 10 of them have come to your yard and are using your yard, that the animals have decided that your home is a, a wildlife sanctuary. Uh, then you put in your application showing that you've gotten those 10 species and attesting that you're uh, adhering to the Healthy Yard Pledge. And if you would like to get a yard sign, you can. It is optional. It's the only part of this program that has a charge to it. Since it's entirely volunteer run, we don't have much of a budget, so we do ask um, for $35 for the yard sign. And the last thing is we hope that you will allow us to put a little tiny green dot on the map on our website saying that in this approximate location, there's another certified sanctuary. It's really great because there's more and more of those green dots all the time, and you can see how they're starting to connect. Um, I don't expect anyone to read through this whole list, but every time I give the talk, everybody says, well, what are the sanctuary species? Um, they are on the Audubon at Home website, and in fact, there's pictures of all of them, which is even better than this list. The list periodically changes. Usually it expands as we identify more animals that we think need sanctuary. You can see it does not include some of the most common things like these squirrels that are in great supply around us. These are the animals that need some support. If you want to get started on becoming uh, certified as an Audubon at Home uh, Wildlife Sanctuary, you sign up to request an ambassador uh, by going to the website. Um, the easiest way to do it really is just to Google Audubon at Home Northern Virginia and it'll get you right there. And to make the request, you toggle through to Arlington Alexandria. There are programs in Fairfax, Loudoun, et cetera, uh, Prince William. Uh, so you want to make sure that it gets to us in Arlington and Alexandria. Uh, here are some local resources if you want to learn a little bit more. All these places have websites. We've mostly been mentioning them, the Master Naturalists, the Audubon at Home uh, website, Plant Nova Natives, the Virginia Native Plant Society, which is a terrific organization, and of course the Master Gardeners of Northern Virginia. And that is the end of my presentation, unless there are further questions, Leslie. Uh, well, 
some folks have been offering great resources to other folks. It's just always nice in the chat when people help each other out. Um, somebody had asked about where you might get the, the bird bath heater to keep the, the water. Um, and somebody had recommended Wild Birds Unlimited. Do you remember where you got yours? Um, my bird bath is actually from Amazon. Um, I've also gotten similar things from Best Nest. They're widely available. You just need to look for heated bird bath. Okay. Um, you're getting lots and lots of praise. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so um, I think we're good. I think we've done it. If you do, if you have time, if you want to, whoever is asking about the native plant pictures, we'll see okay. you comfortable switching back. Well, let's let's and, just point out right here. This is um, one of the milkweeds. I think this is the actual butterfly weed. Um, Asclepus tuberosa. That is not my photo, but it's from Plant Nova Natives. Um, this is one of the American Beauty Berries. This one is over at Glen Carlin, and you can see this very young um, catbird here that uh, didn't seem to mind me coming in close to get its picture. It was just so eager to, to eat those berries. A lot of times young birds are the ones that you can get closest to because they're just they're just trying to figure out how to feed themselves. <laughs> Bless their hearts. Um, I know you can't really see what this plant is, but this happens to be my own front yard and this is a fringe tree that um, the hummingbirds this year have taken to using as their landing spot as they come into the little fountain that we have in our front yard. Fringe tree is a beautiful small um, tree, native tree that has beautiful white flowers that hang down kind of like a fringe giving it its name. Um, a quick question, um, yeah. somebody asked when they're trying to complete their certification, um, do they need to take pictures of the species yeah. in their yard or is it just um, a trust yeah. issue? I'm sorry, I did use the word document and I usually say, and I forgot to say, that doesn't mean that you have to take a picture. It just means that you need to explain what it was doing in your yard. Was it, you know, on a plant? Was it making a nest? Was it eating? Was it, what was it doing? Okay. We don't count birds that simply fly over. Uh, we feel like that's an airplane. You can't really claim that you were in all those states that you flew <laughs> over in an airplane. Instead, we want the, the bird to actually be doing something in your yard. Okay. And we trust you. We don't, we don't make you take pictures. Um, yeah, and I'm not, I'm not sure what those trees were, so I'm not even going to try on that. Um, here's a sycamore tree. That's one I can identify. This is not a, a local native tree. That's a picture I actually took down in Louisiana, but I think it's one of the most gorgeous trees I ever saw, so I, I included it here. Um, and, of course, this is, is Four Mile Run with a whole variety of trees. Um, so this is goldenrod here, and the purple flower that you could see behind it was actually um, fragrant aster. The goldenrods and asters, there's a lot of different varieties of each of them, and they are both powerhouses. They are, in fact, um, the top number, you know, they, they attract the most insects um, of perennials. So they're, they're like the chestnut of, of the perennial world. Uh, so here we've got Liatris, Winterberry, uh, Oakleaf Hydrangea, more Goldenrod, New England Aster. I'm sorry, I'm not sure what tree this is that my husband found this little nest in that I just had to include. Um, here we've got the um, Golden Alexander or Zizia. This is Liatris spicata gay feather, uh, the native um, mo common milkweed, Asclepus tuberosa. This is field thistle, Circium. I'm not going to remember the entire Latin name, um, the American beauty berry. This is Echinacea, another fabulous flower. It's not technically uh, locally native in Arlington, but it is nearby and it's another great plant. Uh, you leave those heads up and it's 
nearly guaranteed that sometime in the winter you will have goldfinches on them. I know I talked about the trillium. Um, these are all invasive. <laughs> Um, I think you just covered the page in particular okay. that she was looking for. So okay, thank you. Okay, well, if if this is it, I'd just really like to say thank you to everyone for coming. Um, I really get excited about what, what we're able to do in our own yards. I, I hope that I've inspired you to, if you haven't before, Go out and just try one plant, get one native plant. Um, we Audubon at home people say, it, sometimes that's all it takes, just one plant, because when people start seeing all the animals that come to it, it converts them and it makes you eager to do more. So that's my challenge. Go out, get one native plant, do one thing to help your yard be more wildlife friendly and enjoy it.